Okay, we're now recording. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hang on one second. Okay, I'm sharing that. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, so we can see it. <clears throat> great. So today we are going to be talking about Google Calendar, um, the good, the bad, the color coded. Um, so I have a passion for Google Calendar. I live by my Google Calendar um, and we will talk about it. Hopefully you will learn something. Probably I will learn something from you as well because it is a, it's such a, it's such an interesting application with so many different features. So, but first, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna drop this link in the chat. You can, you should be able to just click it and go there or you can uh, use the QR code. This is a quick poll. I'm just interested in people's level of experience with using Google Calendar. So I will wait just a second and then I will go to see what the results are. And while we're waiting, um, we are a small group. There are seven people in this Zoom right now. So please feel free to um, unmute yourself or drop questions in the chat at any time. Or if there's something you're like, well, I know a different way to do that, um, then please feel free. This is not meant to be necessarily just like a sit and watch me do things presentation. So take that poll if you will. Um, I'll drop that link in the chat one more time. Should be able to click on it. Oops. And let's see what we've got. Your level of comfort with using Google Calendar. Okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, I had four levels here. I don't even open it. I don't touch Google. I'm scared of it. I, please don't make me use it. Okay. I know some very basic things. I'm pretty good at it or I'm an expert. So I'm just sort of interested in where people are. I think everybody's filled it out now. So, so we're kind of in the middle. Yeah, we know some things and some of us are pretty good at it. And that's great. Very cool. Thank you. Um, the link to these slides is in the chat now. Um, I don't know that these slides are super, super helpful in terms of like content that you'll look at later that will make sense when you're looking at it on your own, but please feel free to use them if you like. So, <clears throat> okay, here's what we're gonna cover. What is Google Calendar? Why is it helpful to use Google Calendar? Um, creating events, setting locations and work hours, communicating and sharing with others via Google Calendar, and then in a very basic way, sort of color coding Google Calendar. It's a little all over the place. And if there's something you wanna know about that's not on here that I haven't included, um, please let me know. And I made these slides like a week and a half ago. So I'm gonna rediscover them as we go through. Um, so Google Calendar in a very basic way, let me see if I can find, is part of what we call the Google suite of products. Yeah, and so you, when you think about the Google suite, it's this, so if you're in Google Drive, which is just drive.google.com, or if you're in your email inbox, you'll often see this like little nine grid. I always think of it as like the Brady Bunch grid. And if you click on it, you can see um, a lot of the Google suite products. So when I refer to Google suite, I sort of mean collectively all of these things. And there are dozens of products. We've talked about some of them. Sam and I did a ULVLC on the larger Google suite a couple weeks ago, if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> and I will also say that this presentation is going to focus on using it for work purposes, although um, you certainly can do this with your personal um, stuff as well. I have some personal stuff on my calendar. It's just easier for me to do it that way. So any Google product that you might be curious about, just let me know and I'll be happy to answer questions about that too. I'm not Google certified, um, but I will do my best. So um, before we sort of dive into the demo here, so pros and cons of Google Calendar. So in my mind, the pros are that it is easy to use. It's very efficient. It has a lot of things built in that make things like sharing and scheduling and um, you know conducting meetings or events pretty easy. Like it streamlines a lot of things. Um, you can see others availability if they have that turned on. This, I will, we're in the safe tree here. So I'll tell you, it drives me crazy when people won't let you see their availability. Like I don't need to see what specific thing you're doing at that time, that's a privacy setting. But when you can't even see the person's Google calendar, um, it does drive me a little bit nuts. So to some extent you can see their availability if it's turned on. I find the interface very clean, easy to use. Um, it is reliable. Um, it's reliable when it's used correctly. Um, 
and we'll talk about that. And it's free. And there's a star beside that because a lot of people say, and I, I don't disagree with this, that with Google, the price you pay is that you are the product and that it's a lot of information that you are sharing um, that is, you know, able to be um, manipulated, tracked, whatever, what have you in a number of different ways. A lot of people believe Google is evil. Um, I don't disagree with them, but I think it's sort of a really, it's kind of a necessary evil. So anyway, UNCG is a Google campus. So I highly encourage you to jump on the Google calendar train. The cons, not everyone uses Google Calendar. Um, not everyone uses Google Calendar to its full potential. And that's not a dig at anyone. Um, it's just that when you are using Google Calendar to your full potential, the level of like just efficiency goes way up. So um, sometimes if you're working with someone who um, maybe isn't as comfortable with some of the features, um, it's a teaching opportunity. Um, there are outages sometimes, it's rare. Um, I will say that <clears throat> I think the last time there was a major Google outage, I can't remember it where it affected me personally. Um, although I know there has been one in the last couple of years. Anyway, it happens. Um, paper planners don't rely on the internet. So I, you know, that is one great thing about using a paper planner. Um, and on that note, I'm not here to knock the paper planner people. I love, it's called the happy planner. Um, I don't use it anymore because I find myself for a little while, I had both a paper planner and a Google calendar. It was doing that in college um, and it worked really well for me then, but I sort of am at the point now with the work that I do, um, paper planners just become sort of redundant for me. If you have one, if you love it, live your truth, like nothing wrong with a paper planner. Those are great. So um, any questions before we get started or dig into kind of the demo that I'm gonna do for you? Okay, so um, let's go through the things that we said we were gonna do. So what is Google Calendar? We talked about that. It is a part of the Google Suite and it is a, um, it is a large, I need to go ahead a little bit on this. I think it's okay to show you this stuff. Let's go to this week. Great. Okay. So um, one second. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just making sure there's nothing like privacy problems on here. Okay, great. So um, it is a digital calendar in a, in a very simple sense. And it helps you, um, even if you're not using Google Calendar collaboratively with anyone else, it can help you organize things and set reminders. I use it all the time for reminders. Um, and it has things like birthdays built in um, that you can sort of import from other places. It's just in a very basic sense, it is a digital planner. Um, <clears throat> why is it helpful to use it? Um, we talked about a lot of the pros and cons, especially for things like SOAR. So we have SOAR coming up this summer. Um, I'm relying heavily on Google Calendar to invite people to things that they've committed to doing to help the library during SOAR. Um, and it's nice because it will show up on my calendar and it will also show up on their calendar and help them remember. I often tell people, um, if, if it's not written down or it's not on my Google Calendar, I'm probably not gonna remember that it's happening. So um, it's a good tool for that as well. So creating events, let's actually go in and create an event. So let's say on uh, Thursday, June 2nd, why not? Let's go in and create my event. And in a very basic way, let me do that more carefully. You can either click this plus sign up here that says create uh, event, or you can click on the time slot that you're interested in. So you can see over here, we, so we've got the date here, we've got the time slot here on a grid. Um, so you click on it, it creates a new event and I'm just gonna title it my event. Um, and what I like to do from here, you can do a lot of these little shortcuts. I like to go into more options. And so what I'll do is I'll invite everyone who's here. No, I won't, not yet. Um, let's say that I needed to create a meeting with everyone who is here in the Zoom right now. Um, this is a lot of people's seven different schedules to try to align and come up with a meeting time for. So one of my favorite features about Google Calendar these days is that right now we're on the event details tab. If you switch to the find a time tab, it shows you um, a grid of this week and you go over here to add guests. Um, so I'm gonna add Catherine and it's gonna show me um, what Catherine has 
posted on her calendar that week, like times when she is doing something. So Christine, Sam, Darren Lee, and Anna. Great. So it's actually not as much of a nightmare to schedule things this particular week as I thought it would be. If we go back a couple weeks, you can see uh, our calendars have lots and lots of different conflicts on them. Like this week, it would be difficult for us to schedule something. So that's another tip. If you are looking to schedule a meeting with people and you have an idea of when you want to do it, obviously scheduling far out in advance is, is a good idea. So you'll see here the original time slot I chose June 2nd at 2 is not available. There are people with conflicts in. So what you might do, you can click the time slot right above it or you could manually change the time here. Um, but I like it because it's very visual, very easy. Just click on a slot that works for you. So I've added my guests, chosen a time. Now let's say that um, we were gonna meet in person. So the library in particular has something, if you, you're on the guest tab here, if you click rooms, um, you can actually search Jackson Library and it will show you rooms that are available. Um, and I chose, it, by default, it will choose available rooms only. Um, for some reason, if you wanted to include unavailable rooms, you could, I think that's unnecessary. So this shows me what rooms are available. So if I wanted to book 216, it tells me the capacity of that particular room, where it is. Um, and to book it, you just click on it. And it actually creates an event on a calendar called Jackson 216. Um, so you've got that as well. So I have my guest list. Questions so far about the find a time or the room booking feature? Okay. So um, guest permissions are interesting. So what I like to do um, by default, it is going to allow any of your guests to invite other people and to see the guest list. For me, um, I find it professionally courteous to always at least have see guest list activated because I think for a lot of people, knowing who you're going to be in a room with is just kind of a very basic thing that you want to know going into a meeting can affect how you prepare. So please always choose to see guest list, in my opinion. Invite others. Um, if I clicked modify event, it would allow anybody who's invited to um, change the time, change the location, change uh, guests or other aspects. And that's not really a big deal. It doesn't choose it by default. So most events, I don't actually end up clicking that, but um, you can if you want to. So um, if we go back to event details here, we're meeting in person in 216 and that's great. Um, so for our meeting, <clears throat> let's say we were going to talk about about pizza, <clears throat> pizza toppings. Okay, so um, I want to, in my description, when you get this meeting invitation, I wanna tell you what it's all about. Like what, what's the point of this meeting? What's gonna happen during this meeting? So I'm gonna say in the description, I clicked add description. We'll talk about which pizza toppings are best. And I'm gonna zoom in so that you can hopefully see better. There are, wrong answers. And you can do things. I mean, you can bold, uh, italicize, underline, whatever you want. If you were doing a lot in this particular section, like a lot in this in this meeting description section, um, that some of this might be helpful for you. You can also attach something. You can add an attachment. So you can attach an agenda. I'm going to show you what I think is a better way to handle agendas. And this is a pretty new feature. But let's say I wanted to attach something. I could attach something from my Google Drive. I could actually upload a file by clicking upload and then browse. Um, and I could, you know, do that. I did my alpha yesterday. So if, if y'all want to see my alpha, I put it in there. Um, but recent will show you things that you've opened recently in Google Drive that you may want to share. So I will just choose my presentation for today. You could also click my drive and it would actually show you a view of all the different folders and documents in your drive and you could search it that way to find a specific document. Anyway, I'm choosing my slides and then I'm going to click insert. And so now anyone who gets this meeting invite will um, have the uh, slides in there that they could potentially look at ahead of time. 
questions about that descriptions yeah yes yeah. I, I have a question Perfect. i'm thinking about um with the faculty senate budget committee in this example i mm -hmm. have an agenda for every meeting mm -hmm. um so and it's in it's a, a google doc Mm -hmm. Well, I should really just put that link in there and then it's convenient. And as soon as the meeting starts up, they can go to the meeting invite and I don't have to put it in the, well, I could still put it in the chat. Yeah. But. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. You totally could do that. You could just click on the paper clip and then you could search for it in your drive by the, by the name, or you could actually browse manually. Um, yeah. And then you just click on the, um, let's see. Here's a video I made on academic search complete insert and yeah it's there and I don't know that there's a limit to how many attachments you could put in there probably is but I've never I've never hit it. That's really helpful because mm -hmm. I you know everybody has access, but then I have to go copy the link and and it's like well they all have access, why do I have to copy this link, but that's that really uh, I, I appreciate that that's very helpful to me, thank you. Yeah absolutely that's a it's a great feature. Um, so yeah, if you have an agenda as another document that you've already done, um, <clears throat> that's perfect. Darren Lee, your question, <coughs> what's the create meaning notes feature for? Um, that is actually a perfect lead in to our next point. So if you click create meeting notes, <clears throat> this is really neat to me. Um, oh, okay, you have to save the event first. So I am going to save the event. It's gonna send you all an invitation. You'll get it in your inbox. You do not need to accept it. Um, when I clicked send, it also says create and share meeting notes. This will create a meeting notes document for this event and share it with all guests, which is what I want. So I'm going to click create and share. Some people need to access the files. Um, and so what you can do here um, is if you want people to be able to edit it, you could change the sharing settings to either view, comment, or edit. Um, and then you could click invite. Usually the meeting notes thing is something that I do after I've created the event already. Um, but in this case, it wanted me to do it first. So now you'll notice there's another attachment that says notes and then the meeting title. So you click it and it actually created this document for us. Um, it has the date, um, it has the title of the meeting, it has the attendees um, as well as the attachments that you can jump to. And so this is really great for taking minutes at meetings or any kind of notes that you want to take. Um, so pepperoni, bacon, cheese, bell pepper, all that. Um, so under notes, you could designate someone to do it. Or one of the benefits of having given everybody editing privileges is that people can kind of collaborate on these. Um, and then action items would be things that you need specific people to do. So um, you could say Anna, um, uh, order pizza, Sam, order dessert, something like that. And if you were feeling really fancy, you could actually tag someone. So if you do the at sign, we could do Catherine, and then I could search for Catherine Heilman and put Catherine's name. And then I could say, um, pay for pizza party. Right, so Catherine's gonna pay for our pizza party. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so, and that would actually send Catherine a notification um, <clears throat> and let her know that she had been, <clears throat> excuse me, tagged in this particular document. So, um, <clears throat> and this is a, I mean, this is just a Google Doc that has kind of some neat features. Um, we could do a whole hour on Google Docs. I won't get into it now, but it's really, really cool. So that is what that particular feature does. Um, I really like it. Sometimes if I have a meeting um, and I haven't created an agenda yet, but I want to create one, I'll create the event and then go back into edit mode and do the um, add meeting notes feature um, and then actually make my agenda that way. But if you have a pre-made agenda, like Christine was talking about, you can actually just tell it what you want included in there, which is great. Um, questions about any of that? I think the meeting notes thing is a fairly recent feature. I started seeing it maybe six months ago. Okay, so um, other things about this. Let's say that we decided, 
um, that we wanted to have this meeting virtually instead of in person. What I would do is um, if you if you book the room the way that we did, um, you could go to your guest list and you'll see that Jackson 216 is a guest. I'm just going to remove Jackson 216, which should free up the room for someone else to book at that time. And then <clears throat> you have two options here and you have to turn on the Zoom feature and we could talk about how to do that. It automatically is going to offer to add Google Meet video conferencing. So if you click on that, it will create a link for people to use to come into the meeting via Google Meet, um, which is really, really nice. Yeah, if you don't have that feature, um, let Sam know and we can guide you to how to turn it on. Um, this is one of my favorite newer features. You can click make it a Zoom meeting. And because I'm already logged in and have it turned on, you can just kind of ignore this and click continue. And what it's going to do is give people a Zoom link to click on. You don't actually have to go into, because the old way, um, you used to have to go zoom.uncg.edu, sign in and schedule the meeting and do all the settings. You don't have to do that if you have this um, built in, which I really love. So that's how you add video conferencing. Questions about video conferencing? This is getting to be a pretty fancy event. We have an agenda, we have a Zoom link, we have guests. So a couple other small things here. Wait, so Christine um, yeah. in the chat said, I only do it the old way, but I'd like to do it the new way. Do you yeah. mean you don't have the add-on, Christine? Yeah, I don't, I think I got confused. And also, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to do it, but I, I can learn how to do it, you know. Well, and I'll say, so it's really improved. When it first came out, Rachel, I'm sure you remember this. It didn't mm -hmm. have, um, uh, like it didn't, like it would be in your calendar, but not on your Zoom settings. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. here's the link, Christine, and it's not UNCG specific. I couldn't find that. Um, I can never find that. But um, it, you'll, if you follow these instructions, when the, you get to adding the add-on, it will ask, you know, for an email address. When you use your UNCG email address, it will ask you about single sign-on SSL, pick that option, and then it should hook you through the regular, you know, double authentication like thing that yeah. you're seeing. And then once that's it, it will, um, be an extension that then shows up. That's what makes it show up within your calendar. So once you do this and it's in the calendar, then you will also see it from zoom.uncg.zoom.us, UNCG, right? Like if you make it in the calendar, it will show up there and then your recordings will still show. It all connects once you set this up. Um, I like don't remember my life before this. It's very convenient. I, I very rarely go into uncg.zoom.us, right? Because this does that, but then you still need to go into uncg.zoom.us for like adding an alternative host to Zoom, um, any kind of settings on the back end, like uh, registration for a Zoom link, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. so sorry, Rachel, to cut no, in. No, no, that's fine. It's a this this was uh, it took me a minute to figure out how to add this too, and this page kind of lays it out nicely. So yeah, um, it's definitely a time saver. Absolutely, it. yeah. Um, so by default, uh, I think by default, it's going to send you a notification, like a pop up 10 minutes before your meeting starts. And you can change that if you want to. If you could say, no, I'd rather get an email 60 minutes before my meeting starts, you can set it that way. I don't know, Sam, you might know this. Will it send everyone an email 60 minutes before the meeting starts? My instinct is yes. I think I unless you've changed your settings, yes. Okay. So you can do an email or a notification. It has minutes, hours, days, or weeks. Uh, I usually, 10 minutes is usually, it's the default. Um, you can also add a notification. If this was like a really important meeting and you, you needed to be reminded several times about it or something like that, um, then you could add multiple notifications. So that is another helpful feature. Um, and then, Availability, what this is, <clears throat> it is going to tell you what other people are gonna see on your calendar. So other people, if you book this meeting, other people who try to pull up your calendar to like find a time, for instance, are going to see you as busy. It will be blocked off. Let's say that you had um, 
sometimes I set reminders on my calendar. Like I'll, I'll say like, um, call the vet or something like that. I don't need that whole hour to be blocked off. It's just on there to remind me to do it. So if this was called a vet, I could say instead of busy, it would say free. So I'm still bookable during that time, but the, the notification will still come up for me reminding me to call the vet, if that makes sense. Default visibility um, is interesting because, yeah, I think the default is private, but if, if um, you wanted people to be able to see, you know, I am specifically in this meeting about pizza, um, then you could change it to public. Um, and you wouldn't be bookable because it says busy, but people could look at the title and the details and the names of the attachments and stuff like that. So I usually don't do that. I just do default, which I think is private and busy. You don't have to mess with any of that if you don't want to. So, um, so RSVP, there are a number of RSVP options now when you get a meeting invite. Um, so um, when you get an invitation, you can respond, yes, I'm coming. You can say, yes, I'm coming in a meeting room, which means you will be there in person. Yes, I'm joining virtually. No, I'm not coming, or maybe I'm coming. So you, it used to just be yes, no, maybe. Now they've added these so that you can be more specific. For instance, when we interview our STEM liaison librarian candidates next in June, maybe, um, I will have hybrid options for a couple of meetings because there will be some people who would rather not be there in person and that's okay. Um, so they will be able to tell me specifically if they're planning to come to the room or if they'll be joining virtually. So it's a really nice feature. Um, you can also add a note. Um, I don't usually use this feature, but it's a thing. Um, I think that's most everything in this particular view. Let's try more actions and see what happens. Okay, you can copy it to different calendars. Sorry, Catherine has a question about this. Yeah, go for it, Catherine. Sure. Hi. Yeah. So my understanding of um, busy and then default visibility being private. So if mm -hmm. you mark something as private, do people with whom you, you know, there's like, I don't share my calendar with you. You wouldn't see like my details of my mm -hmm meetings, but I do share it with some people. So who sees it when it's marked private? Does nobody but me see that? That's what I assumed it meant, but now I'm unclear. I'm wondering. Well, I think you're right. I think that if, so for instance, my calendar is shared with many people um, and most of them can only see whether I'm busy or free, right? That's, that's what most people can see who can look me up. Like with, with most of y'all, I can only see that you're busy. I can't see what it says. Um, my boss, Jenny, um, I have it set there so she can see everything. Like she can see I'm busy. She can all see what I'm doing, anything, any attachments in there. Um, if I put it on private, I think I could be really, really wrong about that. Um, it will still, yeah, it can't be seen by others unless they have make changes to events. Okay. So if you set yourself as private, no one is going to be able to see it except people who have that like very high level access to your calendar. If that makes sense. And I can I can show you like here. Um, this is another thing I wanted to talk about. Is, uh huh. I think the default right Rachel is that everyone sees busy unless you invite in someone as a like full view, which I don't even, I think I had to like Google how to do that when I let Amy in to my Yes, you'll only um, see that's but what she's asking is is there anyone who could see it if you set it as private so my answer to that question is like if you go into my calendar settings and sharing um we can see like for instance jenny my boss can see all event details i thought that she had access to make changes and to make changes in manage sharing so if someone has see all event details or see only free busy then putting on private, they're not gonna be able to see anything except busy. If they have make changes or make changes and manage sharing, then they will be able to see it even if you have it on private, if okay. that makes sense. Okay. Um, nobody has that level of access for me except my personal Google Calendar. Um, some people have see all event details like my boss, my husband, my work wife, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so 
You could also, just a couple other things, if you click this little chat icon, chat with guests, it will actually open up a new Google chat space with all of these people. Um, and it wants to give me a little overview. I'm not gonna do that. I love pizza. It would then send all of you, you probably all just got a chat from me that says, I love pizza. And now we can see Christine is typing response. So is Catherine. So we could do it. Uh, we could chat about that, for instance. Or um, once I've saved the event, I'm going to go back into it and I can see, oh, I forgot to tell people something. Um, I could send them an email. You could click email guests and I could say, forgot to tell you to bring your own napkins send and then they'll all get an email from you. So that's creating events, uh, which is pretty cool if you ask me. Any other questions about creating events? Sam, I didn't mean to cut you off earlier about the privacy thing, if there's anything I forgot. Uh, I guess I have, uh, I use the feature of putting things on other calendars, publicly viewed calendars mm -hmm. and creating public calendars. Mm -hmm. um did you talk about that not yet um sorry to jump ahead i was just no no no, no you're okay I, other things I don't... in google calendar i use no that's helpful um so what you can actually do there's a couple other things so we talked about all of these let's talk about setting locations and work hours so if you go up if you're in your just calendar.google.com view and you click the settings menu click settings um, you can set a couple things, including your time zone, which I think is just going to be automatic. Um, it's going to ask you what you want your default meeting duration to be. I think it automatically sets to 60 minutes. If you choose speedy meetings, I don't like it. You can choose it. It will end 30 meeting, 30 minute meetings, five minutes early and longer meetings, 10 minutes early. So it's basically like uh, cutting off a little bit of time from each meeting. I don't use it because I just am like, I could just make the meeting 50 minutes long if it's only going to be 50 minutes long. For some people, they love it. So speedy meetings is an option. Um, default guest permissions we talked about. Um, add invitations to my calendar. So when someone invites me to a, a calendar event, I'm going to get uh, the invitation will go on my calendar, um, but it will be outlined in a particular way. Let me show you. Like today we had the updated um, Zoom link. So when you haven't yet responded to a meeting invitation, it is a, it's just the outline. Um, it's not filled in. And that tells me that I need to respond to that invitation. So this is what it looks like on the invite T event uh, end. And so I'm gonna click yes with the little video camera next to it. it means I'm going virtually. And now it's filled in. A um, Couple other things. Uh, desktop notifications, options. You can tell your calendar not to show weekends. I show weekends because I put some of my personal stuff on my work calendar. Um, I wanted to show you though, setting your working hours. So under working hours and location. Um, if you wanted to set your office location in a normal Google situation, you could do that. Here, we don't have that power. Only administrators can do it. You really don't need to do it. Enable working hours. What that means is that I have set my working hours nine to five, Monday through Friday. So if someone tries to invite me to a meeting outside of those hours, they, it will have a little icon that looks like a, um, a moon, um, which means like this person is technically not, that's not their normal working hours. You can also enable working location. And what that does is you can see above every day on my calendar, I have a little blank spot like here add location. I can specify that I'm working from the office, working from home, unspecified if you don't want to share that, or somewhere else. Like on Friday, I will be at a meeting at the Mooresville Public Library. So I could add that. And it will ask me, is this just this Friday you're doing this or is this every Friday? I could do that. And I believe, I'm not sure, Sam, you might be able to, you might know, um, I believe that other people can see that. So if other people were trying to invite me to a meeting that day and they were like, we're going to do it on campus, I think it would tell them that I'm not working on in my office that day. Yeah, like when, if right. I like yeah. look up your name or anyone's name who does that, I see at the top mm -hmm. office home, office, Morrisville. Yeah. yeah. 
-hmm. which is helpful because then yeah that's a kind of new feature I mean I think Mm -hmm. they I don't know I've only started seeing it in the pandemic yes yeah that's a that's a COVID thing I think they've made a lot of these updates I think in response to COVID specific issues um I'm gonna sneeze I think maybe (laughs) I'm sorry okay we're running out of time just a little bit so I want to make sure we cover um creating different calendars so I'm gonna back my calendar out a little bit because I'm not used to this view so over here on the left you get a basic like monthly calendar if you needed to quickly go to a specific week you could click on that week um I have different calendars. So for instance, ROI uses something called the city calendar and Jackson 177A um, when we want to book a class for one of the two classrooms. And we all have access to it in ROI. Anybody can see it and everybody has the power to change events um, or make events. And so if I needed to book, for instance, 177A, I could just say reserved, I put my initials. So if anyone has questions about it, they know to contact me. And instead of Rachel Olson here, I'm gonna choose Jackson 177A and save. And so it's saved on that calendar now. But let's say I had a group of like 50 students coming in or 60 and I needed more room than just 177A. I can see from the city calendar, which is the purple one, that um, that space is not that that space is available at this time. So I could click the event, click options, and click copy to city calendar, and then I've now reserved both spaces. So it, the copy to feature is really nice. Um, it's it's pretty helpful. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is um, let's just say I only needed to meet with one person, right? One someone that I meet with a lot is Amy Harris Alk. Poor Amy, she has to meet with me a lot. I can click and open up her calendar or like Anna is someone that I will meet with sometimes. I have people like frequently, people that I frequently meet with show up here. Um, So if I just needed to quickly schedule a meeting with Amy, see if she's free, one person, this view will show me as well. And then I could create an event from there. Um, So that's how to do that. And you can go into, options. And for instance, if that's not really that helpful, um, if you want to color code your calendars, I know we said we were going to talk about color coding. So right now, all of my calendars show up in this like lavender ish color, I think it's technically yeah, it's called lavender. Uh, let's say I didn't want to do that. Let's say I wanted my events to show up in radicchio. Uh, you can change it. And all my events on my calendar are now showing up this way. Let's say I have um, the reference department. The reference department has a calendar that we all share. It's how we tell each other who's out that day, who's, you know, if something funky is going on. Um, you can see that. Or if there's something that affects the whole department, like SOAR, um, we can see that as well. Um, let's say I wanted those to show up in red or something. Um, you can change that. It does not change the color for other people's calendars. Um, So don't worry, you're not messing up anyone. It will show up as red for you. Someone else might have it as mango or, I don't know, banana, whatever. Um, So you can color code in that way, which can be helpful. Um, For instance, if I wanted to look at my husband's work schedule, compare it to whatever I'm doing on a particular day, I can see, okay, this is when Josh is working. So um, date night on Friday will have to be after five, for instance. Okay. Um, That's color coding in a very basic way. Let me see what else So we talk about. Sharing settings, setting locations and work hours we talked about. Is there anything else that people wanna cover like other questions you have about Google Calendar that we didn't talk through? Because there's a lot. There are things that we have not talked about yet. Um, I can show you very quickly these time insights. These are pretty new to me. So it's telling me that of the hours in this week, I am spending 5.8 of them in meetings with other people, which is pretty low. Last week, I spent 15 hours a week in meetings with other people. Um, And on average, I guess it's average per day, I'm not sure. If you click more insights, 
it will show you a breakdown of how you're spending your time. There is something called focus time that you can do. I don't use focus time, um, but you could schedule it. It blocks off. Tell me if I'm wrong, someone. I think it blocks off time, shows you it's busy, and just it's like a so if there's something you want to do every day, like every day from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., I'm going to write. You could do focus time for that. Um, it's going to show me one-on-one -on -one meetings I had, meetings with three or more guests, meetings I need to respond to, remaining time. It will tell me which days were the heaviest for me in terms of meetings. Last Wednesday and Thursday were crazy days for all of us, um, including me. People I met with a lot last week. Spent a lot of time um, with these particular people, things like that, uh, which is kind of neat. I think the time insights can be really helpful, especially if you are someone who, if you're like, I feel like I'm in a lot of meetings lately, you can actually look and see some data about, um, you know, how many meetings you're actually in and maybe adjust if you can based on that. Are there any other questions about Google Calendar? Oh, you can change, uh, you don't have to do it by week. Some people do daily. They just wanna see their calendar for that day or the next four days. I don't love that one. I prefer week. Uh, you could do month. You could even do a year. That is not helpful to me, but some people love that. So. Shortcuts, yes. There's, uh, which shortcut, Sam? You probably know way more than me. The ones no, I, no, do I don't know. are week and month. So if, you, if you're if you on it and you push M, just push M. Oh, just push yeah, yeah, yeah. M. Uh, like yeah, it goes to your it. month view so then you could skip ahead and see what's going on in August or whatever. That's right. And then you could, when you're like, go back, you could just do week. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. D week. for day. Yeah, no, that I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, those are the only ones I use. I don't even know who showed me that. Uh, I'm not really great at shortcuts. And then um, I'm also not much of a shortcut. You person can just always click today to go back to today. Like that's mm -hmm. what I do is like when I'm hopping yep. ahead and then I'm like today. Maybe One today. other thing to show you is like if you have a recurring event. So for instance, with the library writing group, I will very often forget whether or not I've scheduled the next writing group meeting. So I can search writing group and it will show me when they were in the past and when they're coming up which is pretty helpful because then I can see, yes, I've already scheduled some things. Um, so that's kind of nice, the search feature. Anything else that you'll have? You've had a great look at my Google Calendar. I hope that everyone keeps our important meeting about pizza toppings on the calendar. Do. Yes, I was gonna delete it. Um, see you all in a couple of weeks. Yeah, Happy we'll see you. Then. I don't even remember when it was now. Uh, there it is, important meeting about pizza. Um, so. Yeah, pizza party uh, on June 2nd. I'm gonna delete it because I'm gonna show you what it looks like when people delete. You'll get an email notification. Well, thank you for coming everyone. I hope that was helpful. Um, people learned good. something. I think it was like good timing. Um, a lot was covered. Do y'all yeah. have any final questions, comments, tricks that y'all do that you want to teach Rachel and I? Yeah. Maybe learn stuff. I never had paid attention to that analytic stuff or. I don't use it a personal, lot. Sorry. No, for go my for personal it. calendar, I, I like using the location. Yeah, so. that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got like, um, yes. you can set uh, like a physical location if it's not on campus. Like you could say, we're going to meet at Slices for our pizza meeting or something. Yep. Absolutely. And I have like a shared for my personal, like I started a shared family calendar, you know, yes. like I yes, remember a family up, calendar. Yeah. I remember growing up, my mom would always print out calendars yes. and like put it on the fridge and we would all write on it. And I made this family calendar, but um, just, you know, side note for this recording, my husband does not use it. <laughs> so it's yeah. really just no, me that's alone right. on a calendar. <laughs> But um, yeah, like, what was it? You might have multiple doctors because I know I do. And yes. then it's always good to look at your calendar and be like, well, which one? Oh, there it is. <laughs> and just like that doctor is the one you're going to. Yeah, I um, also like my, I have the Google Calendar app 
you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I don't really promote, of course, I'm of course not promoting that anyone do work at home when it's not in your work hours. Sure. Um, but saying that it's sometimes convenient if I'm like out at a meeting, I can just like, you know, quickly add something, but like, you know, I feel like I probably am not using the mobile. I just like usually add something quick. And then when I'm back at my desk, go back in and, um, edit it. You know? I find the, yeah, I find the mobile app helpful. Although you are right that like, if you, there's, I'm sure there's a way to turn off notifications for the app so that you're not getting dinged. Like, I don't know. I, sometimes I wish there were ways to like make it so I can't see it. Cause then I'll just be like at 10 o'clock. I'm like, what meetings do I have tomorrow? I think, like, yeah. I think I've changed. I think I changed it once in my life where like I stopped getting notifications, but then I like have gotten so used to the phone notifications that I right. think it was like making me lazy. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I was, no, like, I'm gonna... not getting what I needed. So I just leave them yeah. on even though they're annoying. Cause I'm like, I want to know. Um, I also have my like personal combined, you know, like I have it turned on in my work where I can turn it on and off. Like it's a different color. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Trying to look at the app and see what, I think I just mostly just again, quickly add events. I can't do anything fancy on the app. Well, I'm sorry that we won't actually be having our meeting about pizza toppings. Um, okay. It would have been one of the funner meetings that I have in, in June. Um, but thank you for coming. If you think of questions or anything comes up later, please feel free to email me and um, enjoy scheduling events. Thanks, everyone. Again, remember there's an IPEG um, innovations programs enrichment grant something. I think I got it close to being right, right, Rachel, you're on yeah. the committee or you were. Um, so be sure to check that out. If you don't know what it is um, and you can't make it, you can still sign up. And I try to send out the recording because I know we're kind of getting to that time of year anyway. Um, as always, let us know if you have any questions. I will send this recording out to y'all because a couple of people emailed me and said they couldn't make it live, but they wanted to see the recording. Um, but they're also always on the ULBLC LibGuide. Bye, everyone. I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Week. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye, Rachel. Thank you.